Welcome to San Joaquin College of Law Today, a show dedicated to issues and events within the law school, which are of general interest as well. SJCL Today is produced by San Joaquin College of Law, a nonprofit law school in Clovis, founded in 1969 to provide quality legal education. Over 88% of its graduates have passed the California Bar Examination. More than a quarter of the practicing lawyers in the Fresno area are San Joaquin College of Law graduates. This edition of our program features our Constitutional Day Lecture for 2013 titled How the Gays Seek to Destroy Us All by Getting Married or Recent Developments in the Law, Human Rights for the LGBT Community. Constitutional Law Professor Jeffrey G. Purvis examines the recent U.S. Supreme Court decisions in Hollingsworth v. Perry and United States v. Windsor and opines as to what they reflect with regard to constitutional interpretation, the rule of law, and the quality of justice in the United States. I'm very pleased to introduce our speak. no, wait a minute, I'm our speaker <laughs> for this evening. So without further ado, welcome to San Joaquin College of Law's 2013 Constitution Day celebration. We celebrate the Constitution on this 226th anniversary of its drafting because it seeks to effectuate the rule of law in America, because it demonstrates our commitment to protect fundamental human rights, and because federal law requires us to do so or our students lose eligibility for federally subsidized educational loans. Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, Justin B. Atkinson, has requested, in fact he insisted, that I read the following disclaimer. <laughs> Professor Purvis makes frequent use of sarcasm and irony. SJCL apologizes in advance to anyone offended by his remarks. Any opinions expressed by Professor Purvis are his alone and do not represent the opinions of SJCL, KFCF, the Pacifica Foundation, the State of California, or the United States of America, whose constitution we celebrate today. I would also like to say welcome to the immense radio audience of Valley Views on the Law, because this Constitution Day celebration is being recorded and will be broadcast, I believe, on Thursday, October 3rd at 1 p.m. on 88.1 KFCF, Fresno's own communist radio station. I always like to acknowledge attending luminaries. Of course, the aforementioned Dean Atkinson is here with his lovely family. My wife, Susan, a graduate of this institution, now practicing law in the Fresno area. The library director was here. Oh, there he is. Just changed places. Director Rooney, faculty professor Goodrich. Judge Caton is here with us. So, uh, oh. Former Governor Schwarzenegger, thank you, sir, once again for showing up. <laughs> Something of a surprise, Justice Scalia. I, I really am amazed, but thank you for coming. I'm sure that most of you here today are regular listeners, listeners to Valley Views on the Law, but for the few of you who haven't had that edutainment, my co-host, Dean Atkinson, and I begin our show with a segment called Dear Professors in which I read emails that I have fabricated from imaginary listeners <laughs> as a harmless and amusing way to convey information about law to the public while sneaking in my own sly pontifications. In honor of our Valley Views on the Law listeners, I will begin with a Dear Professor's email today. Dear Professors, I've never listened to your radio show, Professor Purvis, but I know some students who have been in your constitutional law class. Some of them say you're a crazy liberal, but most of them say you're a fair person. So I thought I would write and tell you why I am opposed to gay marriage and see if you would give me a fair hearing. I'm not a bigot and I don't hate anyone. I am deeply religious and I believe that being a homosexual or behaving as a homosexual is against God's law. There are plenty of sinners in America, and I'm not saying homosexuals should be put in jail or anything, but marriage is a sacred covenant blessed by God and is the foundation of the found family unit. 
I cannot in good conscience support challenging how God thinks about marriage. I'm also afraid that allowing homosexuals to marry would send the wrong signal to our children, who won't understand when it seems that the government is endorsing sinful behavior. If homosexuals have to have civil unions, so be it. But why must the blessed institution of marriage be changed from its traditional meaning? And that's from Josephine Dodge of New York City. Ms. Dodge, today is Constitution Day, so I want to answer you in a serious way by talking about law, our constitutional system, and the relationship between law and morality. One of our most fundamental political values is equal treatment under law, what the Constitution calls the equal protection of the laws. If the government, which purportedly represents a majority of voters, <clears throat> treats one group of people differently from another group, that requires justification. And depending on the basis for the different treatment, that justification may have to be very powerful. The principal justification you offer for denying homosexual couples the right to marry, which is permitted to heterosexual couples, is your moral belief that homosexuality is wrong derived from your religious views. Moral values, including religion-based moral values, can be given the imprimatur of law. For example, the view that it's wrong to steal or to intentionally kill another person without justification. But the Constitution does not permit the legislature to choose any moral or religious values to make into law. For a very long time, it was a widespread religious view that African Americans were cursed with the mark of Cain, which apparently derived from the fact that their skin was darker than that of European Americans. This belief was offered as justification for differential treatment of African Americans and was codified in many oppressive ways, including slavery, segregation, denial of the right to vote, to hold jobs, to obtain an education, and denial of the right to marry anyone who was not African American. For a very long time, women were believed to be inferior in important ways to men <clears throat> and were not permitted to vote, to hold public office, to work at a variety of jobs, and were subordinated by law in the marital relationship with their husbands. I'm not going to say those were the days because that would be wrong. Here's an example of how one religious leader put it in 2004, quote, has God ordained women to be civil leaders, or has he reserved this authority for men only? I believe that the Bible gives a definitive answer to this question. Women are not permitted by God to hold political office and rule over men in the political sphere." Closed quotes. The United States Supreme Court has held that these laws, based in part at least on religious views, are illegal because they unconstitutionally deprive African Americans and women of the equal protection of the laws. Despite the fact that people living today may still have as deeply held religious views, the beliefs that I've just described, views that led to the unspeakable horror of American slavery and the blighting of uncounted lives of African Americans and women, we recognize that laws based on those views are incompatible with the fundamental right of equal protection. So your religious beliefs about the wrongfulness of being homosexual or behaving as a homosexual are not a constitutionally acceptable justification for doing the same things to homosexuals that were done to African Americans and to women, as well as other groups throughout history. I want to remain civil given the context and the fact that you addressed me in a civil manner, but your thinly veiled assertion that homosexuality presents a danger to children is dishonest and dishonorable. First, it assumes wrongly that being homosexual is bad, so that anything that might cause a child to be homosexual would be hurtful to that child. Other than being denied human rights, suffering pervasive discrimination, and risking serious injury or death at the hands of the intolerant, there is nothing bad about being homosexual, any more than it is bad to be a particular race or a particular gender. Second, in the anti-science, anti-reason America that has emerged in the 21st century, I recognize that this may not be convincing to you, Ms. Dodge, 
but to my knowledge, science has not discovered why one person is heterosexual and another is homosexual. Examine your own experience. Ask yourself this, at what point in your development from child to adolescent to young adult did you decide whether you would like to have sex with men or would prefer to have sex with women? If you have an answer to that question, then you might be bisexual and you might want to rethink your abomination of homosexual people. In reality, human sexuality with regard to gender preferences appears to be a complex appears to be complex and is probably better described as a continuum than as a dichotomy. But the likelihood that someone who would otherwise be heterosexual can be persuaded to choose homosexuality is so close to zero as to be indistinguishable from it. Thus, a political majority that chooses to punish or treat persons adversely based solely on their sexual preferences or gender orientation is being unjust. Bigot is an emotionally charged term and may have no place in a, re in a reasonable discussion. But do you want equality of treatment? Do you seek justice for yourself, Ms. Dodge? If so, then you should behave justly towards others. the end. Longtime fans of my Constitution Day presentations recognize that I select somewhat lurid titles in hopes of generating public interest, which clearly worked this time, <laughs> while the actual material I cover is focused on legal and specifically constitutional law issues relating to the topic. Today will be no different. My topic is the significance of two recent Supreme Court decisions on the status of human rights for homosexuals in the United States. As an elderly gent, or geezer, as the kids say, I've lived through several liberation movements. The liberation of African Americans and other peoples of color in the 1950s and 1960s, the liberation of women in the 1970s, and of greatest personal significance for me, the liberation of fat people marked by the founding of the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance in 1969. Thanks to William Fabre, fat Americans are no longer vilified, condemned, humiliated, or routinely made the target of vicious, cruel jokes on late night television. <laughs> and we've solved racism and sexism, too. <laughs> but the course of justice for the LGBT community has not been so smooth. This is from the website of the Leadership Conference, which describes itself as the nation's premier civil and human rights coalition. Quote, in the early hours of June 28, 1969, a group of gay customers at a popular gay bar in Greenwich Village called the Stonewall Inn, who had grown angry at harassment by police, took a stand and a riot broke out. As word spread throughout the city about the demonstration, the customers of the inn were soon joined by other gay men and women who started throwing objects at the policemen, shouting, gay power. I imagine it was glitter, I guess. <laughs> the Stonewall riots inspired LGBT people throughout the country to organize in support of gay rights. And within two years after the riots, gay groups had been started in, gay rights groups had been started in nearly every major city in the United States, closed quotes. As you can imagine, the campaign for gay rights advanced rapidly. So that on June 30th, 1986, about 17 years after Stonewall, the Supreme Court in the Bowers versus Hardwick decision upheld a Georgia statute that made it a criminal offense publishable, punishable by up to 20 years imprisonment to commit sodomy, which it defined as performing or submitting to any sexual act involving the sex organs of one person and the mouth or anus of another. These cover their ears. <clears throat> I know that you are all horrified by the notion of one person's mouth having contact with the genitalia of another. But in Hardwick, the facts were even worse than you can imagine. The two criminals were both men. It is worth noting that the statute applied to heterosexuals as well as homosexuals, and that a heterosexual couple, married couple, were originally plaintiffs in the lawsuit, challenging the constitutionality of the statute. 
but the federal courts dismissed the married heterosexuals' complaints because they lacked standing in that they were not threatened with immediate enforcement of the statute. For those of you who are not constitutional scholars like myself, that means that although the public policy of the state of Georgia was to send you to prison for 20 years if you gave or received fellatio, they only enforced it against homosexual men. To its credit, the Federal Court of Appeals had held that the Georgia statute violated the challenger's fundamental rights because his homosexual activity was a private and intimate association that was beyond the reach of state regulation. <coughs> By reason of the Ninth Amendment and the Due Process Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment, the Supreme Court reversed. Justice White, writing for a five-justice majority, let these stirring words ring out. Quote, until 1961, all 50 states outlawed sodomy, and today, 24 states and the District of Columbia continue to provide criminal penalties for sodomy performed in private and between consenting adults. Against this background, to claim that a right to engage in such conduct is deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition, or is implicit in the concept of ordered liberty, is at best facetious." Closed quotes. Thus, as no fundamental right was implicated, rational basis scrutiny was applied by the court and the statute was upheld. Ah, those facetious gays. We have oppressed you for at least two millennia, ever since God nuked Sodom and turned Mrs. Lot into sodium chloride for having the temerity to look back at the doomed city. How dare you suggest that you have the same right to make love to your significant other as we regular Americans do? Justice Blackmun, writing for the four dissenters in Hardwick, had this to say, quote, despite historical views of homosexuality, it is no longer viewed by mental health professionals as a disease or disorder. But obviously, neither is it simply a matter of deliberate personal election. Homosexual orientation may well form part of the very fiber of an individual's personality. An individual's ability to make constitutionally protected decisions concerning sexual relations is empty indeed if he or she is given no real choice but a life without physical intimacy. <coughs> the court claims that its decision today merely refuses to recognize a fundamental right to engage in homosexual sodomy. What the court really has refused to recognize is the fundamental interest all individuals have in controlling the nature of their intimate associations with others." Closed quotes. Despite this setback, the homosexual agenda for human rights moved forward so that many governmental units adopted regulations forbidding discrimination based on sexual preference or gender orientation. The vigilant citizens of Colorado did not sit idly by as this insidious threat to their homosexuality, sorry, heterosexuality crept towards them. In 1992, Colorado voters adopted by statewide referendum Amendment 2 to the state constitution, which precluded all legislative, executive, or judicial action at any level of state or local government designed to protect the status of persons based on their homosexual, lesbian, or bisexual orientation, conduct, practices, or relationships. <laughs> you might think that the Supreme Court, having concluded that homosexuality was a despicable criminal condition justifying imprisonment, at least when acted upon sexually, would apply rational basis scrutiny to this Colorado referendum and uphold it on the grounds that it was not irrational for the good citizens of Colorado to believe that harm would befall them if people capable of criminal sodomy were permitted to live among them, attend their schools, work among them, etc. But in Romer v. Evans, a 1996 decision, Justice Kennedy, the post of the Supreme Court's weather vane, led a six-justice majority in striking Amendment 2 down. However, the majority did not do so by acknowledging that homosexuals have a fundamental human and constitutional right to equal treatment under the law. <coughs> 
It held that Amendment 2 failed even the extremely deferential to government rational basis standard because it could only have been motivated by animus against homosexuals. And a motivation of animus toward an, towards an affected group makes any government classification unconstitutional. I want to make it clear that I support the outcome of Romer versus Evans, but I criticize the Supreme Court majority for distorting the rational basis standard instead of applying strict scrutiny to Amendment 2 because it invidiously targeted homosexuals solely because of an immutable characteristic, their sexual orientation. I also criticized Justice Kennedy because his opinion did not once mention the Bowers versus Hardwick decision. If the state of Georgia could imprison someone for 20 years for engaging in homosexual sodomy, why would it violate the rational basis standard for Georgia to preclude the city government of Atlanta from including homosexuals as a protected class in an anti-discrimination ordinance? Trying to parse a distinction between being a homosexual and acting like a homosexual is the kind of idiocy that brings about policies like the not lately lamented don't ask, don't tell, where if a soldier kept his homosexuality a secret, he could remain in the military, but if he was ever discovered engaging in a homosexual act, he could be dishonorably discharged. I believe that Justice Kennedy couldn't stomach what Colorado was doing to gays, but as a politically conservative justice, he was unwilling to openly recognize fundamental human rights for gay Americans. And he probably couldn't have persuaded a majority of the other justices to agree with him if he tried to do so. A good outcome for human rights, but a bad decision-making process for the rule of law. Justice Kennedy did eventually take on Bowers versus Hardwick in the 2003 Supreme Court case of Lawrence versus Texas. The law of the state of Texas provided that a person commits an offense if he engages in deviant sexual intercourse with another individual of the same sex. And as is usual in this situation, define deviant sexual intercourse as including any contact between any part of the genitals of one person and the mouth or anus of another person. I might point out this is what makes con law so much fun. <clears throat> getting to say those words and in a serious discussion. But I'm glad the children have been removed. <laughs> I shudder to think of such deviantness, but note with interest that Texas apparently did not mind if the deviates were persons of different sexes. Justice Kennedy's opinion took the Hardwick majority opinion apart, piece by piece, and demonstrated that an adult's selection of another adult as his intimate sexual partner implicates important human rights. Yet even while making a significant improvement in the law's treatment of the LGBT community, Kennedy hedged his bets in this passage. Quote, the statutes do seek to control a personal relationship that whether or not entitled to formal recognition in the law, is within the liberty of persons to choose without being punished as criminals." Closed quotes. Did you catch his qualification? Whether or not a homosexual relationship is entitled to formal recognition in the law? The gays have a human right to engage in sexual acts with each other, but may not have a right to have a formally recognized legal relationship with each other? For a Supreme Court protecting the fundamental human rights of homosexuals, that sounds a little bit squishy. Let's read on. Quote, the petitioners are entitled to respect for their private lives. The state cannot demean their existence or control their destiny by making their private sexual conduct a crime. Their right to liberty under the due process clause gives them the full right to engage in their conduct without intervention of the government. Yay, human rights for the LGBT community at last. Wait. What is this last point Justice Kennedy makes for the majority? Quote, the Texas statute furthers no legitimate state interest which can, which can justify its intrusion into the personal and private life of the individual, closed quotes. My constitutional spidey sense warns me of danger. If homosexuals had a fundamental human right to be what they are and to behave as what they are, 
then Texas would need a compelling governmental interest to interfere with that right, not just a legitimate interest. Are Justice Kennedy and the majority still applying the rational basis test to government oppression of the LGBT community? Having so stirringly shown how vital the human right to love and be loved is to everyone, why would he fail at the climax to straightforwardly identify the fundamental nature of the constitutional interests at stake? Just as in Romer, we have a disconnect between the result reached by the court and the reasoning used by the court to supposedly justify that result. Well, Professor Purvis, you nitpicky nabob of constitutional calumnification, who cares how or why you won, as long as you won? Freedom for gays, lighten up. Let's ask Justice O'Connor to explain what I'm thinking in her concurring opinion in Lawrence versus Texas. Quote, that this law as applied to private consensual conduct is unconstitutional under the Equal Protection Clause does not mean that other laws distinguishing between heterosexuals and homosexuals would similarly fail under rational basis review. Texas cannot assert any legitimate state interest here, such as national security or preserving the traditional institutions of marriage. Unlike the moral disapproval of same-sex relations, the asserted state interest in this case, other reasons exist to promote the institution of marriage beyond mere moral disapproval of an excluded group." Closed quotes. Bingo. We are not going to let the government throw you in jail for being gay, but we're not going to recognize that you have any fundamental constitutional rights at stake, and for goodness sakes, we're not going to say that you have a constitutional right to marry each other. The history of same-sex marriage in California could serve as a primer on the democratic process and majoritarian oppression. Statutory language regarding marriage did not address the gender of the persons involved until 1977. One assumes this is so because if two men had applied for a marriage license prior to that time, they would have been taken out behind the county clerk's office and beaten to death by a righteous mob of straight men in a homosexual panic. However, county clerks in California worried about the possibility that gender-neutral statutory language might entice some government official to allow a gay marriage, induced the California legislature to amend the relevant statute to prohibit persons of the same sex from entering lawful marriage. This was not sufficient for the people of California, who in 2000 passed Proposition 22, which added the following statutory language to the Family Code. Only marriage between a man and a woman is valid or recognized in California. The horror scenario that had motivated these forward-looking political efforts came to pass after a fashion when in 2004, the mayor of Sodom and Gomorrah, I mean uh, San Francisco, <laughs> caused county clerks to begin issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples. The day after the first such licenses were issued, vigilant citizens filed lawsuits that ultimately came before the Supreme Court of California, which held that local officials in San Francisco had exceeded their authority in issuing marriage license to same-sex couples. The California Supreme Court issued a writ of mandate directing those officials to enforce the statutes governing marriage unless and until they are judicially determined to be unconstitutional. Lawsuits had already been commenced by same-sex couples to challenge the constitutionality of California's statutory law denying them to right to marry. And these were subsequently heard by the California Supreme Court in the case of in re marriage cases in 2008. The court held that the challenge statutes were a violation of the California State Constitution. I was struck particularly by this portion of the decision. Quote, although as an historical matter, civil marriage and the rights associated with it traditionally have been afforded only to opposite sex couples. This court's landmark decision 60 years ago in Perez versus Sharp, which found that California's statutory provisions prohibiting interracial marriages were inconsistent with the fundamental constitutional right to marry, 
notwithstanding the circumstances that statutory prohibitions on interracial marriages had existed since the founding of the state, makes clear that history alone is not invariably an appropriate guide for determining the meaning and scope of this fundamental constitutional guarantee." Close quotes. This decision truly was an historic victory for human rights, a victory that lasted almost five months. In November 2008, just over seven million California voters passed Proposition 8, a constitutional initiative which amended the state constitution to read, only marriage between a man and a woman is valid or recognized in California. I'm proud to report that in Fresno County, 68.7% of those voting voted yes to Proposition 8. Although we were only the 14th highest yes percentage in the state of California, being shamed by the over 75% yes votes in Kern and Tulare counties. So we'll try to do better next time. As the previous California Supreme Court holding had been premised on interpretation of the California Constitution, passage of Proposition 8 had the effect of nullifying that decision. Proposition 8's change to the California Constitution was subsequently challenged as a violation of the federal Constitution, which brings us back to Romer versus Evans and Lawrence versus Texas, and a United States Supreme Court that seemingly advances the rights of homosexuals while leaving those rights subject to the vagaries of the most deferential to government and thus deferential to the majority constitutional standard of review, the rational basis test. If the government outlawed peanut butter and you claimed that you had a constitutional right to choose to eat peanut butter, which I would certainly do, the courts would apply the rational basis test to your challenge. The U.S. District Court's decision issued in 2012 in the case of Perry versus Schwarzenegger, did I get that right, sir? Was that Proposition 8 violated the Equal Protection Clause of the U.S. Constitution. But at what standard of review? Here is what the court said, quote, the Equal Protection Clause renders Proposition 8 unconstitutional under any standard of review. Accordingly, the court need not address whether laws classifying on the basis of sexual orientation should be subjected to a heightened standard of review." Close quote. That is a somewhat oblique way of saying that the court applied the rational basis test, found Proposition 8 was unconstitutional, and so needn't bother with any higher standard of review. Why did Proposition 8 fail rational basis review, a standard, as I've said, deferential to government, and which requires the challenger to show that the law serves no legitimate interest or promotes its goals in an irrational way. The district court examined six purported government interests, ranging from upholding tradition, the interests of children and having a certain type of parent, to protecting the religious beliefs of same-sex marriage opponents, and found them all wanting. Quote, many of the purported interests identified by proponents are nothing more than a fear or unarticulated dislike of same-sex couples. Those interests that are legitimate are unrelated to the classification drawn by Proposition 8. Proposition 8 violates the Equal Protection Clause because it does not treat same-sex and opposite-sex couples equally." Closed quotes. During this litigation, the proponents of Proposition 8 intervened which means they were added to the lawsuits as defendants seeking to uphold the constitutionality of Proposition 8. The government defendants chose not to appeal the district court's decision striking down Prop 8, but its proponents did appeal. The Federal Circuit Court of Appeals formally asked the California Supreme Court to answer whether official proponents of a ballot initiative have authority to assert the state's interest in defending the constitutionality of that initiative when public officials refused to do so, and the California Supreme Court said that they did. The federal appellate court then proceeded to consider the appeal and ultimately affirmed the decision of the trial court. The Court of Appeals, like the trial court, held that Prop 8 did not satisfy the rational basis standard, but it returned to the animus analysis of Romer versus Evans, mm -hmm 
refusing to consider whether Proposition 8 violated a fundamental right to marry or broadly violated the Equal Protection Clause. Quote, it is enough to say that Proposition 8 operates with no apparent purpose but to impose on gays and lesbians through the public law a majority's private disapproval of them and their relationships by taking away from them the official designation of marriage with its societally recognized status. <clears throat> Proposition 8 therefore violates the Equal Protection Clause, close quotes. But what should we make of these statements by the Court of Appeals? First, quote, Proposition 8 could not have reasonably been enacted to promote childbearing by biological parents, to encourage responsible procreation, to proceed with caution and social change, to protect religious liberty, or to control the education of school children. Simply taking away the designation of marriage while leaving in place all the substantive rights and responsibilities of same-sex partners did not do any of the things that its proponents now suggest were its purposes, closed quotes. And this, quote, Proposition 8 did not result from a le legitimate Kulturkampf concerning the structures of families in California because it had no effect on family structure, closed quotes. For those of you who do not share my Germanic heritage, Kulturkampf translates as culture struggle or culture war and appears to allude specifically to oppressive government actions taken by Roman Catholics, taken against Roman Catholics and Poles by Prussia during the 1870s. What disturbs me about this language, particularly the phrase legitimate Kulturkampf, although I really enjoy saying Kulturkampf, is that it seems to say that the people of California, if the people of California could convince the court that they were in fact seeking to promote childbearing by biological parents or the other interests identified by the court, then an appropriately drafted measure, which also prohibited same-sex marriages, would have been upheld. And this is made more plausible by application of the rational basis test because each of the asserted supposed purposes would certainly be legitimate government interests sufficient to satisfy the deferential rational basis standard. At long last, we arrive at the review of the California same-sex marriage cases by the Supreme Court of the United States in Hollingsworth v. Perry. I have already described what I believe is a pre precarious skin of the teeth advancement of human rights for homosexuals by the lower federal courts. In Hollingsworth, the Supreme Court said absolutely nothing about the rights of homosexuals. The High Court held that the proponents of Proposition 8, whom the Court of Appeals had allowed to seek review of the trial court decision, lacked standing to prosecute any appeal of the district court decision. The Court of Appeals decision was vacated, so the final authoritative statement of law was the ruling by the U.S. District Court. Yes, all of the majesty and authority of the lowest federal court of general jurisdiction stands half-heartedly behind the equal protection rights of the LGBT community. And if that seems like an anticlimax, it is. But I want to compare the reasoning of the Supreme Court in Hollingsworth to the reasoning of that same court in United States v. Windsor, decided the very same day. Windsor involved the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA, enacted in 1996, signed into law by that valiant defender of gay rights, President William Jefferson Clinton. The portion of DOMA at issue in Windsor was a federal definition of marriage for purposes of all federal statutes and other regulations or directives covered by its terms. This affected over a thousand federal laws in which marital or spousal status was addressed as a matter of federal law. Specifically at issue, was denial of the marital exemption from the federal estate tax to a woman legally married to another woman who had died and left her entire estate to her surviving spouse. As before, the 5-4 decision was an epoch-making victory for the campaign for recognition of the human rights of homosexuals. Here is how Justice Kennedy put it. Quote, the federal statute is invalid for no legitimate purpose overcomes the purpose and effect of 
to disparage and to injure those whom the state, by its marriage laws, sought to protect in personhood and dignity. By seeking to displace this protection and treating those persons as living in marriages less respected than others, the federal statute is in violation of the Fifth Amendment. This opinion and its holding are confined to those lawful marriages." Closed quotes. What standard of review is being applied by Justice Kennedy here? The no legitimate purpose phrase certainly suggests that it is the rational basis test of Romer versus Evans and Lawrence versus Texas. Majority opinions also written by Justice Kennedy. It appears that that test is being utilized, although that is by no means clear. The purpose and effect to disparage and injure language also sounds like the animus test of those previous decisions. As we know from the hallowed and off-sided aphorism, every party needs a pooper, and that's why we invited Professor Purvis. <laughs> same-sex marriage is the law in the state of California, and for those same-sex couples legally wed under any state law, they can now take advantage of all federal laws and regulations benefiting married couples. The cause of justice has been advanced immeasurably. Why am I still whining about it? I whine because, as I described earlier, the constitutional foundations for the legal interests that have been advanced are the weakest possible, a somewhat technical violation of the rational basis test, based on the characterization of what the anti-gay political groups were doing as solely motivated by animus, disapproval, or a mere desire to uphold a tradition of unequal treatment. Recognition that the LGBT community has the same highly protected fundamental constitutional rights as heterosexual couples to marry and to make important personal decisions regarding sexual intimacy would enshrine their human rights and constitutional law much more firmly. Let Justice Kennedy be replaced by another Roberts or Alito, and this might all be swept away as limits on corporate political spending were swept away, as gun control was swept away, and as the Voting Rights Act was swept away. Before I temporarily cease disparaging the decision-making procedures of the legal demigods who sit on our nation's highest court, I must point out how Hollingsworth versus Perry and United States versus Windsor were similar. In both cases, Lower federal courts issued rulings on constitutional challenges by gay plaintiffs. In both cases, the government chose not to challenge those legal decisions, apparently believing that the decisions were correct and just. In both cases, the political conservatives who had supported the oppressive laws depriving homosexuals of rights were outraged by the government's refusal to defend the unconstitutional laws on appeal. And in both cases, those groups sought to take the government's place and defend the law's constitutionality themselves. In Hollingsworth, they were the sponsors of Proposition 8. In Windsor, they were a group of members of Congress called the Bipartisan Legal Advisory Group, or BLAG. <laughs> In both cases, the vic victorious plaintiffs argued that the substitute defenders lacked standing to defend the challenged laws on appeal. The standing doctrine requires that in order to be permitted to litigate a case in federal court, a party must show they have suffered an actual injury caused by their opponent's conduct and that the injury would be ameliorated by the judicial relief they seek. You guys might want to take that down. In Hollingsworth, five justices ruled that the proponents of Proposition 8 did not have standing despite the fact that the California Supreme Court specifically held that under state law, that group was an appropriate party to represent the state interests and prosecute the appeal. Also, despite the fact that the Prop 8 proponents had been permitted to intervene and become parties to the litigation at the trial court level and were the principal defenders of the challenge state law at that level because government officials refused to defend it. Yet according to a majority of the Supreme Court justices, once the trial court issued its judgment striking down Proposition 8, the proponents who had been vigorously defending it suddenly lost the special status they had previously held as sponsors of the initiative. Here is how Chief Justice Roberts put it, quote, Petitioners had no direct stake in the outcome of their appeal. 
Their only interest in having the district court order reversed was to vindicate the constitutional validity of a generally applicable California law. The Prop 8 sponsors also argue that even if the Supreme Court would not recognize a sufficient injury to them, there was a cognizable injury to the state of California, and they were appropriate parties to defend the state's interest in having its laws upheld, as the California Supreme Court had indicated. Here is Chief Justice Roberts' response, quote, the authority the proponents of Proposition 8 enjoy is simply the authority to participate as parties in a court action and to assert legal arguments in defense of the state's interest in the validity of the initiative measure. That interest is by definition a generalized one, and it is precisely because its, propon its proponents assert such an interest that they lack standing under our precedents." Close quotes. In Windsor, five justices held that the Blag did have standing. They were a proper party to represent the interests of the United States government and to prosecute the appeal. Since the United States government, like the government of the state of California, agreed that the federal law was unconstitutional and chose not to defend it in court, how is this different from the standing decision in Hollingsworth? Justice Kennedy identified two important differences. First, the United States had refused to give Ms. Windsor a tax refund even though it, was, it conceded she was entitled to it until the district court ordered the refund to be paid. So that was a specific injury that the proponents of Proposition 8 supposedly lacked in Hollingsworth. Second, because a cognizable injury supported the standing of the United States, which chose not to defend, allowing Blagg to defend the constitutionality of DOMA was not a constitutional problem, but a matter of the discretionary prudential restraints the Supreme Court imposed upon itself. Justice Kennedy wrote, quote, in these unusual and urgent circumstances, the very term prudential counsels that it is a pro proper exercise of the court's responsibility to take jurisdiction." Close quotes. The problem that I am highlighting here is that when two cases present very similar but not perfectly identical facts, and the court reaches opposite conclusions as to the legal significance of those facts, it suggests that the justices may be deciding the outcome first and then adjusting their legal reasoning as necessary to support that outcome. I recognize that the court is not a monolith. Justices Kennedy and Sotomayor supported allowing both the Prop 8 opponents and Blagg to be heard. And Justices Scalia, Thomas, and Alito argued that neither case should be heard. So in this instance, only Chief Justice Roberts and Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, and Kagan took what might be called contradictory positions. But if one had the time and energy, one could find other similar contradictions as to all the justices. Here is what Richard Posner, a federal court of appeals judge, University of Chicago law professor, and well-known legal scholar and writer had to say on this topic, quote, I cannot discern any principles in the pattern of the Supreme Court's constitutional interpretations. The absence of principle supports the hypothesis that ideology drives decision, decisions in the cases in which liberal and conservative values collide." Close quotes. Justice Posner is a conservative and a legal giant. I am a progressive and a legal pipsqueak. But we both perceive a result-oriented approach to judicial decision-making that is destructive of the role the court should play in our constitutional system. How can the court, courts enforce the constitutional limitations on government power, the limitations that are supposed to prevent a political majority from depriving us of our fundamental constitutional rights, if the courts simply mirror the political values of that majority? As we mark the 12th year of our unending war against terrorism, conducted by a democratic president seemingly eager to expand upon the liberty-threatening executive powers arrogated by his Republican predecessor. This should be a matter of concern for us all. Thank you.
I always like to allow uh, time for questions or comments, and we have a little bit of time left unless you have a class to get to, so I'd like to open the floor if anybody has any. Yes, ma'am. I have two questions that were posted several times. The dip marriage and uh, the dip is the difference between cardinal law and civil law the same as a uh, annulment it sounds to me as though you're talking about a form of law that I'm not familiar with. Did you say cardinal law? Yes. I'm not familiar with that term. Cardinal law is the law under the Bible for religious, and civil law is through the court. And okay, well, we might say the law is what the recognized authority... The law is a rule that satisfies the test for legality in a political system such as ours. Um, religious beliefs, which we all have a constitutional right to have, do not have a direct relationship with the law. They are moral values that can sometimes be considered for enactment into law like all moral values. Those are different statuses under law, yes. But one is civil and one is cardinal. Well, that's not correct. Marriage is a civil status in all of the states of the United States. It's a, a legally recognized status that has the imprimatur of law. It may be the same word that religious people use to describe a relationship, but you go down and you get a marriage license from the government. You don't get a marriage license from the church or the mosque or the temple or the little house of Satan, which is where I worship. So marriage is a civil status in our society. See, this is just like class. <laughs> Okay, thank you all for coming, and see you next year. And that brings us to the end of this edition of San Joaquin College of Law Today, presented by San Joaquin College of Law, a nonprofit law school committed to educational excellence and community service. The views expressed do not necessarily reflect the position or views of San Joaquin College of Law. This program has been produced in conjunction with the Community Media Access Collaborative. We invite you to join us in the future as we explore issues and events within the law school which are of general interest as well. For more information about San Joaquin College of Law, please visit our website at www.sjcl.edu or call 559-323-2100.